Yeah, good afternoon, my name's Shucks. I'll be presenting a paper from Diabetic Medicine, which looked at the effect of type 1 and type 2 diabetes on the risk of venous thromboembolism. Um, I think this was in the May, May or June paper. I need to have a look. Okay, so a bit of background. <clears throat> so we, we all know diabetes has an established atherosclerotic risk. Um, and this is very much um, linked to the known cardiovascular and all-cause mortality actually associated with diabetes. Um, and this mortality is in fact greater once your HbA1c exceeds seven. And this was seen in the veterans, start, uh, veterans trial. Um, and the idea behind this is we all believe diabetes and particularly the metabolic syndrome. So all the components associated with that hypertension, obesity, um, but one in a kind of pro-inflammatory state. Um, we have lots of reactive oxygen species, and these in turn lead to endothelial dysfunction and put you at greater risk of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Now, when you actually look at the literature for prothrombotic risk, and when I mean thrombotic, I mean your kind of coagulation cascade and you know venous thromboembolism. There's not too much in the you know in the space looking at you know mortality and morbidity in diabetes. I know there are animal and preclinical human studies which have suggested that in fact, diabetes should put one in a more prothrombotic state. So we know there's raised uh, levels of tissue factor in diabetes, which uh, will activate the coagulation cascade leading to uh, increased production of fibrin, which we'll know is associated with uh, population. Um, there's also, factors that will potentiate uh, the development of a fibrin structure. So raised plasminogen activator inhibitor one, reduced tissue plasminogen activator. These both should, again, put one in a state of pro-coagulation, pro-thrombosis and what upregulation. Well, what are they distinguishing between atheros arterial problems and venous problems? So the arterial problems are very much been linked with endothelial dysfunction and kind of, you know, cardiovascular disease, so it's giving heart disease, strokes and so on. These are more just kind of formation of clot, not necessarily due to plaque formation and then plaque rupture and subsequent clot formation. This is more kind of pro-thrombotic, pro hypercoagulable clot. Yes, it's just that your background has got... Uh cardiovascular mortality, it's just, you know, the two different systems. Sorry, sorry. So various meta-analyses have been carried out to look at the association with diabetes and VTE, essentially. Um, and the evidence is quite contrasting. So one of the early meta-analyses in 2008 suggested there was an increased risk of a two subsequent uh, analyses in 2009 and 2016 felt actually this was quite minimal to almost no risk at all. Um, so that begged the question whether in fact it's related to the subtype of diabetes. So I think the current evidence and the understanding, so the rubric of understanding would suggest that type 2 diabetes is in fact more hypercoagulable and more prothrombotic. So you have higher levels of uh, plasminogen activator inhibitor in type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes have lower levels of HDL, which actually have anticoagulant properties. And type 2 diabetes will also have higher levels of non esterified fatty acids. Again, these are generally proportional to your fat or your weight. But again, these would put one at greater risk of coagulation. So the understanding would suggest type 2 will be at greater risk. Now, this is a Taiwanese study in 2020, which actually investigated the risk of VTE and diabetes, <clears throat> but they predominantly looked at type one versus non-diabetics. And they found a five times increased risk of VTE in type one diabetes. And this was an age and sex matched um, group. So on the basis of that, it's kind of up in the air. So this trial aimed to kind of answer the question, is diabetes an independent risk factor for VTE? And based on our understanding, one will suggest that the risk is greater in type two diabetes. So the methods, so this was a retrospective cohort study, and all the participants were 
in fact, recruited from the Royal College of GPs Research and Surveillance Database. Um, so this is a large database, I think, used by general practitioners. And um, they recruited all adults over the age of 18 in the database that were essentially in the database before January 2009. So the first step of recruitment was really to identify the diabetes population. So this was initially done by a series of coding. So they coded those who had a diagnosis of diabetes. They also looked at those patients who had diagnostic tests that would be very much suggestive of diabetes. So two diagnostic fasting glucoses, random blood glucoses, GTTs, HbA1cs. They also looked at the medications the patients were receiving. So patients on two oral agents, so excluded metformin, I suspect because that can be used in many other um, conditions, or patients on insulin or GLP-1s for subcut um, therapy were included. Then the next step was to classify these as type 1 and type 2. So they've used a seven-point algorithm to uh, you know, stratify the patients. Uh, without going into too much detail, what it essentially does it looks at all the people with diabetes, um, identifies when insulin was started and at which age, um, if they're under 35 and never on an oral, oral hypoglycemic agent, they're stratified as type one. If they're on multiple oral agents, they're type two. If they've been on it for more than two months, sorry, more than 12 months and never on insulin, again, type two, then you kind of get into this gray area where there's non-conflicted diagnostic codes. So if the diagnosis is very clear, then they very quickly go into either type one or type two. Um, if not, then you keep kind of going through these algorithmic processes to either you know, move people into the type one or type two. But essentially, this should hopefully clearly stratify patients who are most likely type one, most likely type two. And where there's any ambiguity, they are undetermined type. So they'll be excluded from the study or put into the non-diabetic group. So the primary outcome um, was VTE. This included DVTs and PEs. Again, this was from all the patients in the database from January, 1st of January 2009, and they were followed up until their first VTE, or they were withdrawn from the database for whatever reason, um, up till the 31st of December 2018. And I think 2018 was used as that's when the GPs transitioned from the read classification to the, I think it's a SNOMED CT, um, which is the classification um, system they use to um, essentially label diagnoses in, in the database. So I guess this way it gives them some kind of uh, consistency, I guess, in how the patients were classified. Um, so we looked at the incident VTE rate per 10,000 person years for type ones, type twos, and non-diabetics. And then the hazard ratios were calculated by a regression analysis and survival free from VTE illustrated using Kaplan Meyer curves. As we expect, there are probably lots of co-founding factors that can associate one with VTE. So the adjusted variables were age, sex, BMI, smoking, uh, CKD three and above, uh, patients being on metformin, uh, which can be associated with platelet dysfunction and bleeding statins as well, which can cause uh, bleeding, aspirin as expected, existing cancer. Uh, I can't see the other, but I'm assuming it's hypertension. Uh, no, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, um, the pill, and AF as a proxy for anticoagulation. Metformin. Sorry? Can you, can you clarify, so I can understand why HRT and malignancy and the pill can be a cause for DVT. Is yeah. metformin a cause for DVT? Well, I think there's some suggestion that metformin can cause increased bleeding risk. Where? Well, I had a look at this, actually, and, because it wasn't 100% clear. I had a feeling you might ask me, but there was a, I think there was... There are a few papers that suggest that metformin can lead to platelet dysfunction, which could potentially, I guess, be a risk or increase one's chance of developing DVT. Um, I need to go into a bit more detail in that, but that's probably the, as much as I could find there. Okay. 
Thank you. Ha, ha, and the adjustment is another fudge. That's the, because there'll be a lot of them on there for me. Oh, all the type twos will be. And it's all the things that fall with that they didn't like to see, that they've had to adjust it, It's a problem, isn't it? Because, of course, if you're on metformin, you're probably worse off than if you're not on anything. And a statin is a risk of believing? The statin, I think, is also a risk of bleeding. I'll need to double check with that one. But I had a look at that quickly. I think it was also a risk. But I can come back to you. But we, we don't tell people, oh, you're, uh, you, you, you should avoid. We don't say what happens. Yes. We don't, no. OK. Which is why those two kind of stood out to me. With an MI, because of its anti-inflammatory. But we don't know what we're doing with that, to be honest. Being honest. OK. And the AI proxy, so I think that's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So it, it, it is. It's a real, when you say adjusted, what do they do? You can tell us. So essentially you stick them in a regression analysis and yeah. you know they try and... I really struggle with that. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Well, we'll, we'll see what the story tells. Yes, you will. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, so this is the kind of baseline data without, you know, overloading you with too much. The first couple of rows are just really your age and as we expect the type two is slightly older uh, the kind of gender spread is relatively equal hba1c is slightly higher in the type one group and as expected the type two have a slightly higher bmi um, but if we focus our attention more towards kind of vte uh, we just put the actual n numbers and percentages here uh, we see proportionally more vte actually in type two diabetes um, and I guess that goes across all the different types of VTE. So just looking at the figures at a glance, one would suggest that in fact type 2 diabetes have a high risk, but we'll look at the more detailed analysis. Yeah, and, and from the databases, you get these like numbers like 1.4 million controls, which is, which is a problem to me, but anyway. So these are the unadjusted and adjusted hazard ratios. Um, so the columns are your first is your kind of non-diabetes, so your control group, and we have all the diabetics, and then we have the two subtypes. So if we just look at the first row, we can see when it's unadjusted for all those variables. As we saw in the table, the type two diabetics do have that higher hazard ratio. But once we start adjusting for variables, starting with age and sex, we see that starts to even out. And once you fully adjust for all the variables, in fact, it switches to where type ones are in fact the group at increased risk and the risk in type two becomes almost negligible. Now, now that is fascinating, isn't it? And that tells you what regression analysis does. <laughs> it's, I mean, we, what the net form have done this because the net form will be adjusted for in the type twos goodness me okay so this next uh is quite interesting because this shows how the ratios change as they introduce an adjustment for these variables so in the beginning we can see a kind of unadjusted as they would label it as crude uh hazard ratios where as we saw the type one risk was almost non-existent and the type twos were higher and then once you introduce age and sex that almost, you know, that's where the crossover happens. And as you continually introduce risk, the effect on type one diabetes isn't as profound as you see in type two. So BMI is another big variable which uh, reduces the risk in type two. So suspecting obesity probably plays a big role in all those type twos developing BTE. Smoking, almost about the same in both. CKD, probably about the same. Metformin, slightly more. But I guess there will be no type ones on metformin, but that does seem to level it off in type two. And you have statin, aspirin, and anticoagulants. Um, this is interesting. I think what would have been more interesting was to change the order in which these are introduced. I don't know if that might have an effect. So if we did obesity first, um, but I suspect, yeah. yeah. Uh, and do you think BMI is an independent variable? See, this is the problem. Is it 
Is there but a that's the thing. Thing? No, they're all linked. So they're all linked. So, Chucks, what, what you really say is that you first didn't see an effect of type 1 diabetes increasing clots. Yeah. Because they also happen to they also happen to be on an aspirin and a statin, which reduce the risk of clots. And they're young. And the, they, the main thing is they're young. Or, I think it's the age is a big one. The age. Yeah. So just for age, and you kind of you know that increases the risk. And the type twos are older. So yes. The odd thing is the type one. So is so the type ones are younger than the general population. Yeah. Not necessarily, because they might be old type ones. Well, it might be they will die. Well, well, that's a good point. Maybe the type ones don't live as long. Well, we know that's probably the case in the population. If you, this is about one point four million as a control group, it's it's basically not selected in any way, and so you don't know what the biases are. It, it, it's not a random group, is it? No. Is there anything on that register? Um, I mean, I guess I guess it's as random as. I'm sure there are lots of people missing on the register, but uh, I guess it's probably as good as you could get. But, but, but there'll be a number of people who are more like, not like, like homeless people. You know, there'll be, there'll be yeah. a bit of a group, really, but there will be a group that it will make, might make a difference to. Yeah. But that, that rise, that's the thing that I mean, it's pointing out the rise of crude to age and sex in the blue group of type ones is a bit of a surprise, really. The fourth, the fourth type two, I can understand. Yeah. Because they're all older, and that makes Why sense. Why are you interested in the crude age at all? It's not even a comparison between the same graph, because there could be people who are 20 versus people who are 50. That's not a comparison. Correct. Because yeah. Correct. But then there's... It's not the age and sex. It's just basic. That's not... So that's really, not it starts here. We should be looking from here. Age and sex. I mean, any good trial should really try and match yeah. the population for age. Uh, okay, so, so, so the real problem is, is the correction for age valid? That, that is what I worry about. I, I hear what you say about why we're not crude because, but then when you start correct for different things, you get different numbers. And so the problem with all these publications is the correction makes a huge difference. So, we, okay, fair enough. We all agree that age and sex is important. BMI, I don't know if it's an independent or a dependent variable. That worries me a bit. Smoking what's probably the is. Of the ET in, uh, in, what's the in, in what? Yeah, so VTE is a risk in, yes, but is it, in, no, but being obese is a feature of, they're linked to type of diabetes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Okay, this is a very interesting slide, I have to say, but carry on. And these are the Kaplan Meyer scores um, illustrating the kind of you know freedom from VTE as opposed to survival. But again, this is unadjusted data, so I'm not really sure how useful this is um, to look at, to be fair. But um, it just illustrates what we've shown before that individuals with type 2 diabetes over time you see that greater risk. Um, but yeah, it, it's, what's the, it's yeah. What's the x-axis? Is it days? Sorry? What's 4,000? Is it days? Yeah, I'm assuming it's days because it went from 2009 to 2000. 10 years, yeah. 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 It was 10 years. Days, yeah, 10 years. 3,600 days, yeah. So, this paper would suggest that there's a greater adjusted risk of ET in type 1 diabetes, which is again contrary to what we understand from the kind of pathophysiology and uh, hematology in diabetes. Yes. Um, we see no increased adjusted VTE risk in type 2 diabetes, even though they make up the bulk of the diabetes population. And this could probably explain why previous studies have shown no associated risk in diabetes. Um, because it probably makes up most of the, you know, it's probably made up by majority type two. Um, as I said, it challenges our conventional understanding of, you know, insulin resistance being linked to um, anti, uh, sorry, pro thrombotic states. Um, what was quite interesting, there was that other Taiwanese paper, 
in 2020, which had quite high, high risk of ETE in type one. I think theirs was over fivefold um, increased risk, um, which was a bit strange. But I think what might what that might be an account of the fact in their non-diabetic group, their, their risk was much lower. Mm. And so I think the data from this study, I think was more in keeping with uh, other data in non-diabetics. So I think that's probably what brought the odds, sorry, the hazard ratios down in this paper compared to the Taiwanese. Uh, right. so in patients with Cushing's, <laughs> no, are very hypercoagulable. It is not because of the insulin resistance, if you believe this day, it must be something else, like the cortisol. Because mm -hmm. they're overweight. And one would have thought it's because of the insulin resistance, but it isn't. Because you're saying there's no clear link between insulin resistance and BT. Remarkably, yes. Whereas Cushing is very hypercoagulable. So is it just cortisol or something else? But, well, Cushing's have a number of factors that all come together. There's the obesity. But the other ones you're saying is, yeah. Yeah. The insulin resistance isn't. So if it's not the insulin resistance, what is it yeah. about the obesity that causes the Yeah, well, obesity does. Yeah. Without insulin resistance. Probably from the information. If you have a starvation without insulin resistance. Yeah. The type of diet um, is great. Yeah. What is what is what is what is the results? So the question is kind of what's the clinical relevance? Yeah. Because uh, um, I suspect we will treat them the same, um, but maybe it's something to consider when you know these patients are exposed to situations that put them at slightly increased VTE risk. So maybe you know, perioperatively, post-op, COVID, as we're seeing now. Um, yeah, yeah. Will, will it necessarily change what advice we give to these patients with regards to anticoagulation? How long should they be on anticoagulation? Uh, and do we need to quantify it? I mean, it's a bit increased, but it, and I... Yeah. 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 But also, like with COVID, your risk could be different at different stages of the illness and there yes. other variables that we don't even know about, but um, potentially, it's tricky. Mm. Those are the only kind of times I think it could be of clinical significance, because um, ultimately we'll treat the risk, we'll treat them at risk when they're exposed to risk. But... It's whether you count the type one as an increased risk independently, that's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and the mechanisms around this are very unclear. Um, you know, we know that there have been suggestions of, you know, raised clotting factors and diabetes, but I don't think anyone's actually really measured the difference in these factors between the two subtypes, and that's probably something that needs to be looked at in a bit more detail. Um, but kind of pros and cons, I think, I think the pro is that it's the first to really look at this. So I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, it's using, you know, large data sets that are, you know, measured with quite good fidelity. So I think there's a lot of accuracy now, whether, in fact, the spread of the data could be skewing the results, as you suggested, um, is another issue. But again, I think the data is of pretty good quality. Um, the cons are, I don't think they're justice for HbA1c. Um, and we do know, like with DCCT, that as you increase your HbA1c, your cardiovascular risk increases. So does is the same true for VTE? Um, I think that's that would have been nice to have. It's really they haven't adjusted for HBO1C. Which is a really measurable thing. The data exists. Uh, yeah, why not? They, 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 they said the data wasn't as readily available. Okay. Something it's along those lines. Readily available. It's checked a lot, and it's also on all the. Oh, right, hang on. The controls won't have any. The controls, I guess. Yeah. yeah the controls won't. Yeah. But they could check between. The they could compare type one and type two, but it's it's it, it. Yeah, I don't understand the steps. It's weird enough to know if it's possible. Okay. Um, a few other risk phenotypes are missed, such as fatty liver and so on. Mm. And. Um, 
again, the analysis wasn't time bearing, so they didn't actually factor people changing their kind of where they sat in the cohort. So if someone in the non-diabetic group developed diabetes during the trial, they stayed as non-diabetic. Mm. So that, that could skew considering we know how prevalent type two diabetes is. So I'm sure yeah. a lot of that, how many million ended up with diabetes over 10 years. Yeah, yeah. And that's pretty much that. Great, thank you very much, Chucks. There's some food for thought. Something, I think, I thought the title was a bit interesting. Yeah. It's, it's common, so. And important, thank you.